Um, I first off want to start by saying this will this will be a, a rather personal uh, sermon. So they usually start with uh, not my words but thy words, but they'll be my words. So um, I do apologize; it might uh, turn some people off. But uh, uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, so just stick around to the end. Um, to give you the basic background of why I'm preaching here today, uh, of course, Dr. Knott was ill, and I was in Peru at the time, and Phil had asked me, hey, at some point in the future, would you like to talk about the mission trip? And I said, well, if he's going to be out that weekend, I'll just go ahead and take it. Um, I got invited to go on the mission trip, the uh, Medical Ministries International mission trip by Dr. Bose, uh, who is also an elder at the church, and my personal optometrist. These are his work. Um, and... Uh, and it was a perfect timing because uh, I was going to present uh, at a conference, the International Studies Association Conference, I'm a professor, um, and I was going to go straight from Ecuador, where that conference was, to Peru. And so it was just perfect timing. I was really happy to do it. Um, I travel a lot. Uh, people who know me know that. Um, I have a passport, and right now of the original 20 pages, only eight of them have no stamp. Uh, and I got this passport five years ago, so it hasn't been that long. Uh, and I found that all of my best stories when I travel start with talking to strangers. Uh, in fact, on my most recent trip, uh, it, when I started off in Ecuador, I had an opportunity to go see the Equator, um, and I thought that would be really cool, take some pictures there, but I had to get a cab first and I got the cab during my, the lunch break of the conference. Uh, and I get in the cab, and, uh, and she doesn't speak any English. I speak just enough Spanish. All of our conversation ran out after about 10 minutes. She was a huge fan of the San Antonio Spurs. She loved all my pictures of uh, seeing them. Uh, but realistically, it was sort of hard to have a conversation. My Spanish is, you know, Duolingo Spanish. It's not, I can't really speak Spanish. Um, and, uh, and at one point she said, do you like the music? And I said, it's okay. Uh, and she said, well, what's your favorite kind of music? And I said, oh, I like rock and uh, heavy metal. And she said, okay, um, I don't listen to that very much. You mean like Nirvana, right? And I was like, yeah, that's a famous rock band, sure. So I get out, I take my pictures at the equator, uh, I get back in the cab at about 10 minutes, and she set up her phone to go into the speaker where she has a 90s rock playlist on it. And it starts with Nirvana, which is fine, uh, as a good band, um, but my favorite part was actually a couple songs in, we got to a great song called What's Up by Four Non Blondes. And for those of you that missed out on the 90s, uh, I was able to uh, get my uh, cab driver who spoke spoke no English, to scream sing along with me to the song. I'll turn the mic off real fast. <laughs> the chorus really should not be applauding that. But the point is... We had a blast. She didn't speak any English. I didn't speak much Spanish. But we were, and believe me, they, they repeat that verse more than once. Um, we were singing and singing and singing the song, and we connected. It was beautiful. Um, and, and those are the kinds of stories you get when you travel, when you go crazy places. And so I went straight from uh, Ecuador to the Galapagos Islands, where I had a great day. Uh, and then I flew from there to the mission trips in Arequipa. So I make it to Arequipa. And I'm expecting it to sort of continue on in this pattern. I'm going to have this good time. I'm going to meet these people. It's going to be great. Dr. Bose is there. He vouched for it. It's going to be fine. But I have to say that I had a feeling within the first day of being there that I really didn't belong on the mission trip. I really felt like an outsider. Um, and it was... I. Uh, it was quite extreme. Uh, I heard them telling jokes. I heard them having conversations, jokes that I didn't think were funny and conversations that I really didn't want to jump in the middle of. Uh, I felt very isolated on the mission trip for the first couple of days. Um, and you see, the thing is, of course, that I was hiding a secret from all of them. And the secret was that I'm a liberal. And I'm a liberal with a capital L. I'm so liberal, I, <laughs> I'm so liberal, I even want my water to be blue. I'm so liberal, every time I walk by Ted Cruz's office, I have to cross myself. <laughs> I'm so liberal that when I tell people I'm a Presbyterian, I always have to pay PCUSA, not PCA, PCUSA, <laughs> just so they know. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the distinction between the two branches of Presbyterianship, there is a very wide difference. Um, and I found that I have a hard time 
in our modern era, in the past two years of the Trump presidency, and even well before that, of connecting uh, with a lot of conservative people, and then very particularly with evangelical Christians, which was most of the crowd that I was around. Um, and this is much older than anything that's happened in recent history. Way back when I was a kid, there was a kid in my Boy Scout troop, my Cub Scout troop, uh, named Kyle, and he invited me to a thing called Awana. And Awana is sort of like the evangelical version of Boy Scouts. And it starts off really fun, and we're playing games, and we're jumping around, playing ball, and I'm having a blast. This is my old friend Kyle. What could possibly go wrong? And then right after that, they had Bible study. So I go into Bible study, and indeed, they read the passage that we just read, along with a couple others, and proclaimed that people that weren't Christian don't go to heaven. And I went up to the adult that was leading the Bible study afterwards, and I said, are you telling me that you think four billion people are going to hell? And he said, yes. And I said, one of my best friends is Jewish. Do you think he's going to hell? And he said, yes. And you see, when people ask me, Matt, why are you liberal, it's a pretty easy answer. We could talk about taxes and policies and international relations, and those are lots of issues, but when it comes to some other issues, some of my best friends are Muslim, some of my best friends are gay, some of my best friends are immigrants, one of my best friends is transitioning right now from female to male. And so when people, especially people in positions of power, talk about those people as if they don't deserve equal treatment or full rights, Their persona non grata, I don't want to vote for that. And now I'm coming home crying to my mother. This man, he quoted the Bible and he said, my friend Adam is going to hell. And my mother, good Catholic that she was, said, well, do you think that this guy knows more than St. Augustine? Because let me tell you something. (laughs) So all of a sudden I got my introduction to Augustinian theology uh, and it was great. And ever since that time, when I'm around evangelical Christians, I tense up, say, these are the people that made me cry when I was a kid. These are the people that try to pass laws to hurt my friends. These people are the people that make me feel fear. And now I'm surrounded by them in another country far away. On the very first night that I was there, (laughs) my roommate tried to convince me that the world was 6,000 years old. And I just nodded. I just didn't say anything. I just didn't even want to have an argument. But I had to acknowledge that here I was sharing a room with somebody that I was actually afraid of. That's kind of a strange position to be in, so much so that, of course, I'd agreed to give the sermon before I'd ever been on this trip. It was the Monday morning I was in the airport when I agreed to give the sermon. Now I'm sitting there wondering, what am I going to talk about? (laughs) This is not a great trip. I might even want to consider, you know, not doing this, backing out of this. But I went to work, and I found myself in the hospital in Arequipa, Peru, being taught uh, the uh, auto-refraction machine to help people with their eyes. And we saw 400 patients a day. And I mean, over the course of two weeks, there are thousands and thousands of patients. Free surgeries, free glasses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Peru is an interesting country. If you're not familiar with its recent history, it obviously has a very long storied past, the heart of the Inca Empire, etc. But its recent history is rather, rather intense. In 1980, a civil war began that lasted for 20 years. In that civil war, almost 70,000 people died. Even when they caught the leader of the Shining Path, a Marxist, communist, anarchist resistance organization, caught him, put him on trial, did everything. The president at the time gave himself emergency powers and declared himself dictator. In the year 2000, he was overthrown, had to flee the country, and if he ever comes back, they're going to put him on trial for war crimes. That's 20 years, 70,000 dead. And most of that war happened in the places I went to, Arequipa, Cusco, Quechua speaking country, the native indigenous population suffered 75% of the casualties. And as I was doing auto refraction for these people, it occurred to me that some of them had been on one side and some of them had been on the other. Anybody that was older than 18 had been in the war, had been experienced it, and anybody that was 30 or older than that might have even fought in it. Did I give a free pair of glasses? Did I give a free eye exam to a terrorist? Did I give it to a dictator supporter? Statistically speaking, yes, absolutely, I did. I don't know who, I don't know why, 
because I didn't ask, because that was the right thing to do. We went down there to give medical support to people we didn't know. If we turn away people at the door, we're not doing our jobs. So, how many terrorists did I give glasses to? I don't know, I couldn't tell you, because that wasn't my job. And I found myself asking myself, if I don't have any harsh judgment reserved for the Peruvians, why am I being so judgmental of the Americans? We've built a society that rewards outrage. We've built a society that gives us likes and reposts and retweets for our hatred. You can almost guarantee that something will go viral if you can just put a little anti or pro-Trump bumper sticker at the end of it, just one little line saying, and this is why those people don't know any better. Ezra Klein, in a recent piece, wrote an article fantastically titled, Twitter is not your friend. And in it, and I'll read a piece from this article, he says, Twitter is not your friend. It is built to reward us for snarky in-group communication and designed to encourage unintended out-group readership. It fosters both tribalism and tribal collision. It seduces you into thinking you're writing for one community, but gives everyone the ability to search your words and protect them and project them forward in time and space outward into another community and at the point when it'll do you maximum damage. It leaves you explaining jokes that can't be explained to employers that don't like jokes anyway. And it's not just what we write, it's what we see. Our feeds are filled with reasonable, funny, thoughtful comments from our groups and the most unreasonable, offensive tweets sent by our out groups. If you're a conservative, the liberal tweets that get shot into your sight line aren't the most thoughtful or representative missives. They're the ones designed to make you think liberals hate you are idiots, or both. The same is true if you're a liberal. You see the worst of the right, not the best. And after you've seen enough of these kinds of comments from the other side, you begin to think that's who they really are, and that you're getting a true picture of what your opponents are really like and what they really think of you. But it's not a true picture. It's a distortion built to deepen your attachment to your friends, your resentment of your opponents, and most importantly, your engagement with the platform. And it's one that plays into our tendencies to read the other side with much less generosity than we read our own side. I found myself on this trip asking a hard question. I had to ask myself, am I a bigot? And the answer is yes, I am a bigot. We had a visitor two years ago named Yvonne Naylor. She'd come from Northern Ireland a place that I used to live, a place that was torn to pieces by its sectarian and anti-religious bigotry. She used to say that she cannot say that she is not a racist. She can only say that she's a recovering racist. She cannot say that she is not a sectarian. She can only say that she's a sectarian in recovery. So I can have I unfortunately have to say that too. I am a recovering sectarian. But can I move beyond that? Can I feel empathy for people who are different? I wrote some of my graduate papers on a great philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas, who once said that when you're confronted by the other, a term that he actually coined that we now use all the time, but there you go, it goes back to a 1940s philosopher. He said, when we're confronted by the face of the other, we have only two choices. We can love them or we can kill them. Now, he survived the Holocaust, so he meant that quite literally. But we can take the very literal connotation out and just say we can either befriend them or we can hate them, because those are the two choices we're presented with now. A year ago, neo-Nazis marched on Charlottesville, Virginia, a place not too far from where I grew up. One of my friends was one of the counter-protesters protesting against the um, neo-Nazi faction. When that car drove through the people, the crowd, and injured those people and murdered that one person, I worried for her safety. I didn't have a whole lot of empathy in my heart that day for the people waving Nazi flags. Today, right now, as I'm giving this sermon, 
Those same neo-Nazis are marching on Washington, D.C., my other hometown. And one of my friends is in the building right next to the protest. No fault of his own, it was a big comic book convention. He didn't even think about it. Now he's trapped in that building, waiting for the protest to end so he can go home. I told him to be safe, that I'd light a candle for him, and I hope that he's gonna be fine, but that's the world we live in now, isn't it? The world that we built, the world that we have. In the movie The Great Dictator in 1940, Charlie Chaplin finds himself, the movie's sort of the prince and the pauper, but instead of the prince and the pauper, it's the fascist and the Jew. And because they look the same, they accidentally get swapped. And now, as a Jewish man, he's presented with the challenge of speaking before the crowd of fascist supporters. And he has to speak honestly and hope that his one speech can change their minds. And he says a quote from the speech. It's a very long speech, but this is just one paragraph. He says, greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives us abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. He said that in 1940, but it's hard not to read it in modern times. We have a choice in modern America. One of my friends made a joke. He said, I'm trying to figure out who America's rival is. When we see the World Cup, when we see the Olympics, uh, I know that the French have a rivalry with the Italians, the English have a rivalry with the Germans, the Spanish have a rivalry with the Portuguese, the Brazilians have a rivalry with the Argentinians. America, your rival must surely be Russia, right? Rocky IV, Miracle on Ice, that's who you guys play against. And I said to him, oh, buddy, he's from Cameroon. I said, look, we love to beat the Russians in a sports match, but there's only one group of people that Americans truly hate, and that's other Americans. We can barricade ourselves in or we can reach out. It's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to hurt a lot. But at the end of the day, we don't have to compromise on our deepest held beliefs. If I say the world is 4.5 billion years old and my roommate says the world is 6,000 years old, there is no middle ground. We can't split the difference. If we decide to come together and say, well, maybe the world is 2.25 billion years old, then we're both wrong. <laughs> Neither of us have gained anything. But what we can do is acknowledge the humanity of the other person. I can vehemently disagree with somebody and still see them as a human being deserving of human dignity. Indeed, the very person I described in that story talked to me every night, prayed with me, invited me to run, invited me out to dinner. He even offered to buy me hot chocolate. Can't get better than that. Not in Peru, you can't. <laughs> Even for these truly wretched people that are marching on my hometown today, I can view them with hate or I can view them as lost souls. If they marched on Jesus, he would have given them bread. In fact, the paragraph right before the paragraph that was read today is the story of the fishes and the loaves. People come to see Jesus. Jesus gives them bread. He doesn't ask them first, who are you? What's your background? Do you believe in me? Did you kill anybody? He doesn't ask those questions. He feeds them because they're hungry, and that's all there is to it. And indeed, if the people that were marching on my hometown today came and visited me in Arequipa, I would have given them a free eye exam, no questions asked. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't stand up to them and their racist views. It is only to say that they are still human beings. At one point in my isolation, one of the people on the trip approached me. I was sitting by myself at breakfast, not talking to anybody, which I'd done for the past two or three days. She sat down next to me and she asked the smartest question somebody can ask a college professor. She said, so what's your research about? The next 30 minutes of her life are gone. <laughs> Believe me, she got an earful. But at the end of it, I felt like I'd made a friend. 
because she just kept on asking more and more interesting questions. And I was overjoyed to have made one friend on this trip. But it was funny, because once I started talking to her, well, then she introduced me to somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else. And by the end of that day, not but eight or 12 hours later, I had a group of them, and I took them to the Catholic monastery right next door, where, because I'm such a big history buff and had already toured it once, I was able to give them the tour. And then after that, we got hot chocolate. It was fantastic. I went from having zero friends to having a bunch of friends in one day, just because somebody was willing to come up and talk to me, and just because I was willing to listen. I had a choice. I could have said to that woman, hey, look, I'm just trying to eat breakfast here. I don't really want to get to know you that well. But I didn't. And by the end of that day, I was surrounded by laughing, happy, chocolate-drinking, evangelical Christians. I left Arequipa reminded that Christianity is nothing if not a big tent. There are two billion Christians. If Christianity is big enough to hold me and my roommate, then it's big enough to hold a lot of people. As, as the letter from St. Paul says, truly in Christ there is no male or female. There is no Jew nor Greek. And if I might add, there is no liberal or conservative There is no white, black, Hispanic, or Asian. There is no PCA or PCUSA. There is only the love of God. And as the first letter of John reminds us, in love there is no fear. I started a couple paragraphs ago by telling you about the things I don't take literally, but perhaps there is one thing that I do take literally. That is that God is love. That every time we put aside our fear and embrace our love, we embrace God. Every time we feel love and are in love, we are in the presence of God. God will wipe away the tears of the world, and love will heal our hearts. And every time we say hello to the stranger, we are saying hello to a child of God. And we have a chance to say hello to ourselves just one more time. And maybe this time, we'll see something new. Thank you.